Last month, we talked about hitting the target of Christian living. Our sermon series was called Arrows, and we asked the question, what would it look like if we as a Christian or we as a church were to hit the target that, God's, that God has set before us? What would that look like? And, uh, and we found that in Philippians chapter 2. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 today, and we are going to look at Paul's warning to the church. You know, whenever you have a good thing that's happening, um, there are things that can inevitably go wrong. There are things that we need to be warned about. You know, C.S. Lewis, for instance, he's a great Christian writer, a great Christian apologist. He had this idea, which I do believe is true, that there is nothing inherently evil in and of itself. It's all how we use it. It's all how we respond to it. Um, Whether that's sex or food or money, things are good. It's how we respond and use them that can make them evil. And that's the same thing it is with truth or Christianity or the Word of God The Bible itself, obviously, is not evil, but it can be used in an evil way. Paul was writing to this church, as we said, at Philippi. It was one of the first churches that he planted in what the Greek area was known as Macedonia. Philippi was this very important city, as we talked about over the last few months. But they had a problem. One of their biggest problems in the church itself was disunity. They weren't getting along. They were partners with Paul in his mission work. They gave out of their poverty, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8. I mean, this church has a lot of things that are going right, but one of the things that is going wrong is disunity. And one of the main problems that they're facing as a church is Jewish evangelism. Obviously, for any of us who are Christians for any amount of time, we know that Christianity is built upon the Jewish scriptures. Jesus himself was a Jew. He died on the cross for our sins. But inevitably, after about 10 years after Jesus died, Gentiles began entering the church, and Gentiles are basically non-Jewish people. And so Jews and Gentiles are trying to get along in the church. It's causing a lot of problems. Paul deals with this in the book of Romans. Well, the church at Philippi is predominantly Gentiles, but not all of the Jews converted to Christianity. In fact, a lot of Jews made it their mission to prevent Christianity from spreading. And so just like Christians would send out missionaries to convert the world, so the Jews also sent out missionaries to convert the world to Judaism. And that's what we find here at the church at Philippi. The church is encountering Jewish doctrine that's rejecting Jesus as the Christ, but then there's also something else they're encountering. They're encountering something that's called Galatianism. Galatianism is this idea, it's what Paul deals with in the book of Galatians, that faith gets you saved, but good works keep you saved. It's what some Jewish people believed. In fact, they'd say something like this. If you believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, that's good, but you have to be circumcised. You have to do this work of the law in order to be saved. And so you can see this problem. Paul himself as a Jew is writing to the church saying, look, Christ alone is the basis of our salvation. In fact, if you turn to another system or if you turn to another way to be saved, like making yourself become circumcised, he says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 4, you have fallen from grace if we turn away from Christ. And so we're going to look at some warnings that Paul lays out in Scripture. And this is going to be a little bit more heavier on the side of theology, but we will be able to apply it to ourselves in our own practical life, and we'll be able to assure ourselves of our own salvation based on what Paul's trying to teach us here in the Scriptures. Now, before we get into this passage of Scripture, just a little bit of background about this idea of circumcision. Israel's covenant was marked out by God through the means of circumcision, through the cutting of flesh. And so what they would do as soon as the son was born, eight days later, he would be circumcised, and that served as a mark for him to become a part of the covenant. And so they would teach him, him and her, both males and females, they would teach them what it meant to be in covenant with God. And so circumcision served as this very powerful symbol, I am in a right relationship with God. I am in a right relationship with God. And so they carried this idea over even into Christianity, that yes, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Yes, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but this powerful symbol is now going to be transferred onto us. So if you're a Gentile and you're a grown man and you haven't been circumcised, I've got some news for you, these Jewish missionaries were teaching. You've got to become circumcised. Now, that's really bad news, <laughs> right? That is really bad news, not just practically, but also on the side of theology, because what it means is that there are works that you must do in order to make yourself in a right-standing relationship with God. Now, as you can see, this is a problem. 
This is a big problem for the church because the church, the earliest church, Paul himself taught that it is faith in Christ that brings you to salvation. Faith is the means of salvation. In fact, now, as a Christian, circumcision is useless. There is no point to be circumcised other than that's just what you prefer. There's no spiritual view, in other words. And so the predominant view of these Jewish missionaries was simply this. You had to become Jewish in order to be saved. You had to be circumcised. And so Paul's going to give them this warning. But notice in Philippians chapter 3, just like Paul did in Philippians chapter 1, just like Paul did in Philippians chapter 2, so now Paul does again in Philippians chapter 3, before he deals with the bad stuff, he takes a moment to pause and he rejoices. Notice what he says in verse 1, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. That yeah, we've got things that are wrong. Yeah, we've got problems. Yeah, we're facing persecution. We've got a lot of issues. Yeah, there's problems in the church, but let us not forget to rejoice and give thanks for what we do have and who we have and whose we are. It is one of the most important themes in the book of Philippians is to pause and be joyful. And so if we're going to ever deal with any major theological problems in the church, if we're ever going to overcome our sin issue, we have to take a moment to pause and give thanks. You see, the basis for the church at Philippi, the basis for their faith, was their common experience in the Lord. And so Paul echoes over and over again, rejoice. And this is a consistent message that he has throughout the book. You know, Paul was writing, as we said, over the last few weeks from prison. He's in prison for the gospel of Christ. He's in chains, literally, under house arrest. For years, he is sentenced to prison for really unjust cause. And yet he says, I rejoice. Despite the disunity that's going on at the church at Philippi, He says, I rejoice. Even when Paul was attacked by his own fellow preachers in the church at Rome, Paul says, but I still give thanks. I rejoice that Christ is preached. If anybody has the right perspective on life, it's the Apostle Paul. And so look what he goes on to say in verse 1. He says, look, I'm going to write these things to you, and it's no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. In other words, the same things that I have told you before, now I'm going to write them down. And we find that over and over again in the gospel and in the the New Testament. Do you know that this book that we hold right here is a collection of the sayings and the life of who Jesus was, what he did, and what his early church did? The same things that they taught and they preached and they shared— eventually was recorded down in what we call the scriptures. We're talking about real people in history, real places, real time, real event, real churches, real problems. And they had to deal with these same issues over and over again. Do you think unity is a problem for the church of today? Yeah. (laughs) Do you think sexual immorality is a problem for the church of uh, of today? Well, sure. The problems never go away. They just consistently need to be readdressed. That's why we fellowship on Sunday. Look, if you're coming to church thinking that this church has it all together, you're wrong. If you're looking for a preacher who's perfect, you've come to the wrong church. I have to deal with the same issues over and over again. I have to consistently turn back to the Bible over and over again to overcome my own sin issues, just like we do. But that's the beauty of the gospel. And so Paul says, look, I'm going to tell you this again. And he would tell this to other churches. Look what he writes in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. It's up on the screen. He says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the tradition that you were taught by us, either spoken by word or by letter. Hold fast to this book. We preached it to you. We wrote it down for you. Hold fast to these teachings. Well, why is that? Because Paul's purpose is to keep the foundation of their faith free from the cracks and the weaknesses that develop through human nature. We're sinners. We mess up. We make mistakes. As the church, we try to hit the target, but we fail. But this word guides us and helps us get on target. And that's what Paul's reminding the church at Philippi. I'm writing this to you again because the same problem is still there. There's disunity. And you've got Jewish missionaries who are trying to convert you to something that's false. And so here's Paul's first warning. He says, look, I'm going to paint a picture for you. Okay, I like pictures. I work well with colors and images. And so Paul says, this is what an authentic believer does not look like. I'm going to give you a parallel. You church, you Christians, here's what it means to not be an authentic believer. Look what he says in verse 2. He says, look, I want you to look out for the dogs. 
I want you to look out for those who do evil, the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now, that kind of seems derogatory, doesn't it? Doesn't that seem unchristian in a way that we would categorize us today? Paul says, look, these Jewish evangelists, they're dogs. They're evildoers. They're mutilators of the flesh. Now, why does he call them dogs? Well, look, we are big, pet-friendly people in America, aren't we? I'm a dog lover. I love dogs, right? I just let them come on up and have their way with me, and I pet them and hug them, and they give me kisses. I love dogs. Dogs are like the best animal in the world, okay? But dogs in Greco-Roman times, especially in Jewish times, they viewed dogs as these scavengers who would kill people. That's how they viewed them. They would invade areas that they weren't welcome They would invade your house. They would invade the markets. They would steal your food. They could not stand dogs. In fact, the way that they viewed dogs is viewed over a large large part of the uh, Asian world and the Middle East world. Dogs are not friendly creatures for the most part, and they don't like them. Well, that's what Paul says these Jewish missionaries are. And look, as much as it is hard for us in our culture to accept, there is truth and there is falsehood. There is right and there is wrong. There are people, for instance, that are not welcome to teach and preach here because what they might teach or preach is false. It is absolutely false. Whether it deals with something like what we're going to talk about this morning or sex, gender identity, what is true, whether or not God exists, what is moral, there are things that we don't want taught here because we believe that it's false. And that's okay. It's okay to disagree. It's okay to point out things that are false, just like Paul's going to do. And so he calls them dogs in this poetic fashion because these teachers simply are not welcome because what they're teaching is evil and it's false. The psalmist wrote this in this high poetry. He says, each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They wander about for food and they growl if they don't get their fill. They want it their way. They're like dogs invading a place that they're not welcome. That's what Paul says is happening here. Now in context, we know that Paul calls them enemies of the cross because they're influencing the church with doctrine that is false. If you want to corrupt a culture, you do it through ideology and doctrine. You go after the children. You go after those who are in university. You influence them on politics and religion and ideas and science that warps and changes and manipulates their worldview. That's the goal. You know, today is Parents and uh, and Child Dedication Sunday. It'll just be about 10 minutes that we're going to leave for the end of service. And it's parents who are saying, look, we want to raise our children in the knowledge of the Lord. We want to raise them to be followers of Jesus. And we want your help, church family. That's what, they're, that's what they're here for. We want your help. We want to do this together. We want to be in this together. If we are going to raise a successful generation, it takes a village. It takes a community. And so Paul is dealing with a group of people who are going after ideas and doctrine. What else does he call them? He says, look out for the evildoers. They're evil because what they're teaching is false. It's deceitful. They are disguising themselves as true followers of Christ, but in reality, their doctrine is causing people to fall away from Christ. And then he says they mutilate the flesh. That's a strong word, isn't it? Here's literally what Paul is saying. They put their confidence in their flesh, who they are, what they look like from the outside. The physical operation is the basis for their hope and salvation. Paul put it like this. I want to read it to you in Galatians 5. Paul says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. There's no benefit to being in Christ if you appeal to circumcision as the basis of your faith to be justified before God. He says, I testify to you again, every man who accepts circumcision, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Here's why circumcision is so bad on a theological level. Because now you're required to keep the entire law found in the Old Testament. Do you know why that's such a problem? Nobody can keep it. We're in big time trouble. We are basically saying, God, instead of appealing to you on the basis of what Christ did on the cross, I'm going to appeal to you on the basis of who I am as a person and what good works I can keep and what I'm able to do. That's scary. That's a major issue, not just for us, but also for Paul. And he says they are putting their confidence in the flesh. And look what he says. He says in verse 4, you are severed from Christ. 
You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Here's the ultimate danger. Through appealing, not just through circumcision, we can do this all the time in the church. If we attempt to appeal to be right before God on the basis of anything other than the work that Christ did on the cross, we can potentially fall from grace because we're appealing to a different system of salvation. It happened in Galatia. It was potentially happening in Philippi, and it can happen right here today. And so here's Paul's point. An authentic believer is not someone who places the basis of their hope, of their salvation, on the works of law, or even on good works in the Christian faith. You know, there can be a predominating doctrine in our churches today that, yes, come to faith in Christ. It's on grace. It's free. But what you do day, on, day in and day out, week in and week out, will determine whether or not you're saved. It's a spiritual yo-yo. One moment you're saved because you've had a good week. The next moment you're lost because you've had a bad week. Up and down, up and down. It is a works-based salvation that is contrary to the gospel that Paul talks about. When we fall from grace, we appeal to God on the basis of our own works. And there are different systems that do that. For instance, the sacrament system. These basically sacraments are channels in which grace is infused to the soul by performing that deed. And so taking the Lord's Supper, for instance, getting baptized into Christ, for instance, these are literal things that you can do to have grace infused into your soul. And there is modern-day Galatianism. Remember, Galatianism is simply this. You do something to keep yourself saved. And we can do this all the time. Look, taking the Lord's Supper doesn't save us in the sense that that act infuses grace into your soul. Taking the Lord's Supper is a reminder that we're saved on the basis of the cross, and it keeps our faith alive and is active. Taking the Lord's Supper is a good thing that we should do every week, but it is not a system or a means by which we receive salvation. That is by grace through faith. Baptism. Baptism, I agree with this, by the way. Baptism is a symbol of our salvation, but it's not merely a symbol of our salvation. Baptism into Christ, we have a baptistry right back here, is a real-time live event that God in that moment declares you not guilty. It is not the means by which we are saved. It is the time in which we are saved. God decides to change his mind about us, but the act of baptism itself isn't the means of salvation. The means of salvation is faith. And so these are things that the church can get wrong. Now, just because baptism isn't the means of salvation doesn't make it non-essential or unnecessary. You see, faith is certainly necessary, but that doesn't make it absolutely the only thing that is necessary. The Bible also talks about repentance. We need to change our idea about sin. We need to change our idea about ourselves. We need to run away from who we used to be and run towards God. We also need to be baptized into Christ. We also need to keep the faith. We can't just come to belief and then not remain in belief. And so, yes, faith is essential for our salvation, but it is not the only thing that we must do. It is not the only condition that we must meet in order to be saved. God will not extend salvation to a person who hasn't changed their mind about their sin because they haven't ultimately changed their mind about Christ and what he says about sin. And so this is the theological problems that Paul is dealing with, and he dealt it time and time again, dealt with it time and time again. I love this verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Paul says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is the channel. Faith is the means. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so there are people that think by giving money or taking care of the poor or taking the Lord's Supper, these are a basis for our salvation. And Paul says, no, we are saved by grace, through faith, at the time of baptism, for good works. That's the biblical doctrine of salvation. And that's what is happening at Philippi. They're saying, no, you are saved through circumcision and keeping the old law. You know, God has never looked upon the works of man on the basis of our salvation. God has always been interested in our heart, and that's something that the Judaizers miss. You see, they thought that they could just change the flesh and you would be good with God. And we think that too. We think, well, I'm a good person, don't we? I don't murder. I don't steal. I don't cheat. I don't lie too much, right? I mean, God would certainly accept me. 
Or maybe we think that Jesus Christ was the greatest American that ever lived. There are a lot of people who think that because you're an American citizen, that means you're inherently saved and you are a part of God's favored nation. That's simply false. That is not true. Now, I'm an American citizen. I love being an American citizen. I'm a patriot. I love our country. But the cross comes first. My identity is in Christ. And the means of my salvation is not wrapped up in who I am nationally or who I am ethically or what my race is or what family I come from. And sometimes we think that and we can be tempted to think that. Paul says the basis of our salvation is Christ and Christ alone. He says in verse 3, He's going to show us what an authentic believer actually does look like. He says, look, that's who they are, but this is who we are. For we are the circumcision. This is true circumcision is what Paul says. Who worship by the Spirit of God and who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Hold on a second. Are you telling me that under the Old Testament, circumcision was supposed to be about the heart and not just the flesh? Yeah. That's what Paul's saying. You see, Israel was not God's favored nation because they were circumcised. Israel was God's chosen nation to bring about the Messiah. And the circumcision of the flesh was meant to be a symbol of what kind of people they would be on the inside, not just the outside. And God has always been concerned about the heart. For instance, the first king of Israel, you know what God looked at? Not their stature, not their good looks, not their height, not their strength. God told Samuel this, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so where did Israel go so wrong? Where did they make the mistake? The mistake that they made was by putting confidence in their flesh. Oh, we're good. Check mark, circumcision. Check mark, I go to church every Sunday. Check mark, I tithe. Check mark, I do good works. Check mark, I'm not a bad person. I have made the basis of my salvation off of who I am rather than who Christ is. If we fail to deal with the heart, we have missed the heart of the gospel and what God's mission is for our lives. And so Paul says, look, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God, and this was God's plan all along. I like what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah told Israel, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah inhabitants of Jerusalem. And so here's Paul's warning. Warning, warning. Here it is. The time foretold is now. The circumcision of the heart is now. Remove the foreskin of your heart now. Circumcision of the heart is necessary in order to enter the kingdom of God. Paul put this Uh, in scripture in Romans chapter 2 he says for no one is a Jew who is one merely outwardly nor is circumcision outward and physical but a Jew is one inwardly this is a Jew talking here and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit not the letter and his praise is not from man but from God true Jewishness Paul says is not in circumcision it's in your heart and who you are and who Christ is making you. Now, here's the question. When does circumcision of the heart take place? Well, look what Paul writes in Colossians. He says, in him, being Christ, you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, and which you were also raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses. It is at the time of baptism, Paul says, where God circumcises our heart. He cuts away that dead skin, so to speak, so that we can be alive again. God gives us his Holy Spirit, He forgives us of our sin. He removes the stubbornness and the hard-heartedness that sin has made us. And he gives us the freedom and ability to follow him again. That's why baptism is necessary and important. It's not the means of salvation. It's the time where God says, not guilty, heart circumcised. You are a part of me. Trespasses gone. You know, when we talked about baptism a little bit last week, we had several people Uh, sign on the connection cards, interest to be baptized. In fact, we had one person who was late in age. They had reached 80-level status. 
It's never too late. It's never too late. One of my favorite parables is in Matthew 22, where Jesus gives this parable about God hiring workers. He first hired workers for eight hours. A few more workers came in. He gave them the same pay, but they only had to work six hours. A few more came in. He gave them the same pay, but they only had to work four hours. He finally worked his way all the way up to where he gave someone the same pay for only one hour. And the person who worked eight hours was upset, and rightfully so in the worldly perspective. Hey, wait a second. We had to work eight hours for this. They only had to work one. And the master said, it is not you to decide what I pay and what I give. It's up to me. It's never too late to accept Christ and to be baptized in Jesus' name. It's never too late. And so what are the signs of a true believer? What are the signs of someone who has been circumcised by the heart? Well, first of all, Paul says they worship in spirit. It's not just about gathering together on the Lord's day, Paul says. It is about worshiping God with your inner being, worshiping him, praising him, following him with your heart. It's not just about keeping the New Testament law and following regulation. It's about wanting to keep it, wanting to follow God, wanting to obey. And the good news is, is if you want to and the desire is there, God says, okay, That's good for me. I can work with that. But to the person who bases their salvation off of what they do, not off what Christ did, it means to fall away from Christ. Paul says they glory in Christ. They boast in Christ. They have confidence in Christ. Not on what we do, but on what he has done. And so Paul's main point is simply this, that the church ground their confidence in Christ rather than any human social privilege. For the Jews, it was circumcision. For the Romans, it was being a Roman citizen. What about for us? What's the symbol and the status that God loves you and our culture today? Maybe health? Maybe you've got a lot of money? Maybe you belong to the right nationality? Maybe you've got the right skin color and therefore you're accepted by God? In your mind, what is it? If you were to look at someone and say, wow, that person must be highly favored by God. Paul says, it's the heart. It's not what color of your skin, or how much money you make, or what class you're in. It's your faith. That is the basis of who you are. Now, Paul says, look, and I like illustrations. Like I said, I work really well with colors and pictures. And so Paul's going to give us an illustration. He's going to use himself. Let me show you why this is so true. Let me show you why appealing to the Judaizers who want you to go undergo circumcision as the basis for your salvation. Let me show you why putting confidence in the flesh is the wrong choice. He says in verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's going to show us why. Paul converted to Christianity. He lost everything. He gave up status, privilege, wealth, power, influence, racial identity, ethnicity, his parents, his lineage, everything that was important to him. Paul says, look, I had it all. And look what he says. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel, not just Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, where the first king came from. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I spoke the original sacred language. I studied it. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. I believed in my faith so much that I even persecuted the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. When it came to the old law, Paul was perfect. That would be like me saying, I am of the wealthiest class in Western culture. I've gone to Harvard, Yale. I've got two doctorate's degrees. When it comes to being a moral citizen, I not only pay my taxes, but I give to the poor. If there is anybody that could claim confidence in the flesh, it would be me. I'm the smartest. I belong to the elite class. I've made the most money. I've had power and influence, and yet I am even a good person. I don't steal. I don't rob. I don't lie too much. I have confidence in my flesh. Paul says, I had it all. Now he breaks it up into two different sections. I had advantages by birth. I was just born in the right place at the right time with the right parents. They circumcised me. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews under the tribe of Benjamin. I had it all. And even when I got older, I achieved the most you could achieve. He belonged to the school of the Pharisees. They were the elitist of their time. They were number one in their culture. How does Paul view that advantage? How does Paul view the confidence in his flesh? Look what he says in verse 7. 
Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. It's nothing. Now, parents, if you do have a child that you're going to uh, bring up on one of the five families, you can be dismissed. You can go uh, get your child and bring him back in and make your way to the front pew as we cover these last three warnings. But Paul says, whatever I had, whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for Christ. What a godly perspective. It doesn't matter what school you've been to or how much money you make or where you've come from or who you are or what you do for a living. Paul says that, <laughs> that is nothing. That is nothing. And so here are three warnings that we're going to end with that I hope we can all take to heart. Here's warning number one. We find a principle here in the scriptures, and here's what it is. Simply stated, any attempt to impose requirements beyond faith in Christ as the means of salvation is a perversion of the gospel. And let me share this with you. It is oh so tempting. Just because you go into the ministry, just because you memorize scripture, just because you give to the church, which is good. These are all good things. Just because you attend church every Sunday, just because you've been baptized into Christ is not a basis for the means of your salvation. They're not. The things that we do are not the basis of the means of of our salvation. Now, faith has two components. It's intellectual assent to facts, believing that Christ is who we claim to be, believing that Christ rose from the dead, and that you believe beyond a reasonable doubt that what Jesus said about himself and what the apostle said about Jesus is true. But it's also this. It's also saving faith that leads to confident trust of obedience. You see, faith is not just merely assenting logically to facts. It's trusting in God enough to obey. It's like going to the doctor. Well, you believe in the doctor's credentials, don't you? You believe that the prescription of medicine is what's going to heal your body. Yeah, I believe that. Confidence is taking the medicine. It's accepting what the doctor had to say to be true. So that's warning number one. Warning number two This passage stands as a warning to all who think that they can be at peace with God without submitting to the Christian gospel. Paul says, look, it is not a matter of your flesh. It is not a matter of circumcision. It is not a matter of keeping the law. It is a matter of submitting to the gospel. I had to do it as a Jew. I kept the law. Paul says, I was zealous. You know you can be sincere about something, but also sincerely wrong. We do it all the time. We believe something is right. This has to be true. And then we find out that it's not. It was actually false. Paul thought that what he was doing was the right thing. And we can think that too. But Paul's point, his warning to the church is this. In order for us to be at peace with God, it's only grounded in the gospel and what Jesus had to say about truth, about morality, about what to do. And so the point is simply this. Privileges are meaningless. They are of no value if our basis for our salvation is not in the cross. And so if I had a key phrase, I would put it like this. Jesus calls us to abandon our philosophical and religious system, no matter how noble they may seem, and embrace the gospel. And for us, culturally, that's a tough pill to swallow. That's a really tough pill to swallow. Because we like our culture. We like things. We like feeling like a good person. We like our social status, measuring who we are, what kind of value that we have. And Paul says, look, It's the gospel. We have to submit to it. And there are things in our culture, there are things that we want to do, but we must give up for the sake of Christ. And then here's warning number three. It is possible for Christians to shift their focus from Christ and to become concerned with the qualities that the fallen world considers important as an end in themselves, with the flesh, is what Paul calls it. We can get baptized into Christ, be saved, come to church, and the next thing we know, say, look, I got saved. Now it's about climbing the social ladder. Now it's about getting more money. Now it's about all of these other things, making my body look good and placing so much confidence in the flesh to the point that we have fallen away from what is true and what matters. And our focus can shift because we become distracted by things at the end of the day serve no value as a basis for our salvation. Jesus put it like this in Mark 8. For what, prof- for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and in the end forfeit his soul? Forfeit his soul. Worldly success is good. 
I hope you guys are the most wealthy, well-to-do people in the entire state of Maryland. I hope God richly blesses you. But don't confuse that for what our focus should be 